God is going to dwell among them. Therefore, God asked Moses to build him a sanctuary. Uh, this sanctuary was called the tabernacle. Este santuario se llamaba el tabernáculo. The word tabernacle comes from the Greek and it means simply an altar, a place of worship. Uh, and this is not a Webster dictionary type of definition, but simply it was a place of worship. It was an altar. And uh, today uh, I'm going to play you a video. Uh, it's only, this video is only in English and German, so I'm going to put it in English. Uh, and uh, I'm going to play you a video of the tabernacle. And then what we're going to do is later on, we're going to go piece by piece, step by step, and we're going to have a tour around the whole tabernacle, and we're going to find the typology of it or the symbolism that was done in the tabernacle. The, tabern the tabernacle, yeah. The tabernacle uh, typified Christ and his sacrifice. And everything that you see to the last rope, to the last nail, to the last vessel, to the last furnishing in the tabernacle typifies Christ and his sacrifice. El tabernáculo era un sitio donde se iba a adorar a Dios y todo lo que hay en el tabernáculo, desde las cortinas, los muebles del tabernáculo, los altares del tabernáculo, uh, como el altar de incienso y el altar del holocausto, o el altar de sacrificio, todo esto tipifica a Cristo. Y después de esta introducción que damos hoy, vamos a comenzar en un viaje eh, eh, a través de todo el tabernáculo vamos a pasar por todas las partes cómo fueron hechas y qué tipifican qué símbolo tiene en cuanto a nuestro cristianismo muy bien let, let us see the video now uh, okay. and thank you for bearing with me Le. tell them to just wait while we get it just uh, wait a little bit while uh, <laughs> uh, we get it together in the meanwhile any questions any preliminary questions? Or do you want me to entertain you? <laughs> uh, do you see the screen? It's loaded. Yeah. Muy bien, estamos tratando de ponerle el video. Muy bien, here we, we go. Oh, okay. Vamos a, let us see this video and I will answer all your questions afterwards. Okay. Do you hear it? We hear it, but we don't. All we see is somebody swimming in water. <laughs> somebody swimming in You're water. You're supposed to see something that says gateway films. There we go. You don't see the tabernacle? I don't see anything. All I see is your screensaver. Are you serious? Okay. No. <laughs> okay, hold on. All right. All right, then I have to share something else. Hold on. And this is only the introductions, remember? Uh, and uh, it's going to take us a couple of classes to fulfill everything. How about now? Uh huh. Now we see it. Okay. okay. Play the movie. I want you to pay attention to this carefully. And if you have questions at the end, ask me. Pueden ver este video. Y si tienes preguntas, puedes preguntarme. Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me. And every man whose heart moves him Lo oye? shall raise my contribution. Lo estás oyendo, and let them construct. Sí. Es Éxodo 25, 1 al 2. And the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the furniture. Just so you shall construct. Esto es para que tenga una idea de cómo se ve. An amazing self-sustaining pillar of fire, partially veiled by clouds, became a visual cue. Está hablando de una columna de fuego que había en el tabernáculo. But their investigation of the land God had promised them caused them to fear for their lives. 
again. Yet this time, they did not give God the opportunity to show how he could deliver them. Instead, they chose their own way. Sad. The result of this disobedience was to be forced to wander in the desert wilderness. Eh, los israelitas tuvieron que caminar por todo el desierto a causa de su pecado para llegar a Canaán. El tabernáculo. At night, the presence of God would appear as a pillar of fire to direct them and protect them. And by day, it would appear as a pillar of cloud. And throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sun of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. Whenever this divine cloud would stop, the sons of Israel would assemble and set up camp. Each tribe had specific instructions about where to establish its camp. In the center of the encampment was the tabernacle and the presence of God. The sons of Israel shall camp, each by his own standard, with the banners of their father's household. They shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. Now, those who camp on the east side toward the sunrise shall be of the standard of the camp of Judah by their armies. And those who camp next to him shall be the tribe of Issachar. Then comes the tribe of Zebulun. On the south side shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben by their armies. And those who camp next to him shall be the tribe of Simeon. Then comes the tribe of Gad. Then the tent of meeting shall set out with the camp of the Levites in the midst of the camps. Just as they came, so they shall set out every man in his place by their standards. On the west side shall be the standard of the camp of Israel by their armies. And next to him shall be the tribe of Manasseh. Then come the tribe of Benjamin. On the north side shall be the standard of the camp of Dan by their armies. And those that camp next to him shall be the tribes of Asher. They are the tribes of Nahum. These are the numbered men of the sons of Israel by their father's household. The total of the numbered men of the camps by their army, 603,550. The Levites, however, were not numbered among the sons of Israel just as the Lord had commanded Moses. God is holy. Nothing unclean or anyone with sin can exist in the presence. With the Israelites, and the place will be consecrated by my glory. Next, we see a large basin of water placed strategically between the brazen altar and the tent of meeting. The labor was a vessel of physical and symbolic cleansing for the priests in their service before the Lord. It was absolutely essential that they were to be clean before beginning the process of meeting with their holy God. 
Make a bronze basin with it a bronze stack or wash it. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his son were to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting an offering made to the Lord by fire, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. Once again, we come to a place of further separation and increasing holiness, for only the priests would enter into the tent of meeting to tend to the tasks inside. The curtain served to place emphasis on purity and consecration, which were prerequisites before proceeding into the first room of the tent of meeting. This visual reminder heightened the importance of God's holiness. Make a lampstand of pure gold and hammer it out, face and shadow. Its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms shall be of one piece with it. Six branches are to extend from the sides of the lampstand, three on one side, three on the other. Then make it seven lamps and set them upon it so that they light the space in front of it. Its whip trimmers and trays are to be of pure gold. The talent of pure gold is to be used for the lampstand and all its accessories. See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Closed off on the outside world, the single source of light for the holy place came from the seven lamps atop the golden lampstand. The combined light of these lamps would reflect well off the walls since they were covered completely with gold. The ambient glow of the lampstand would illumine across the room to the table of showbread. On this table were kept 12 loaves of fresh bread, one for each tribe, as a continual reminder of man's need for God's provision. This offering of bread was called the bread of presence, since it was kept before God's presence. Make a table of acacia wood two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make around it a rim a handbreadth wide and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. Make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, and carry the table with them. And make its plates and dishes of pure gold, as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of presence on this table to be before me at all times. Since the desert was not a source of abundant food, God provided all the food the Israelites needed to sustain them. The table of showbread, then, represented an offering to God. They would give an offering of their first fruits from the abundance that he had provided. It was a thanks offering, expressing gratitude for God's abundant blessings. The altar of incense represented the need for the prayers of the people to be continuously directed upwards toward God, and that those same prayers would be received by God as a sweet aroma and be pleasing to his ear. Make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square, 
a cubit long and a cubit wide, and two cubits high. Its horns of one piece with Overlay the top and all the sides and the horns with pure gold, and make a gold molding around it. Make two gold rings for the altar below the molding two on opposite sides, to hold the poles to carry it. Make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Just beyond the altar of incense was the holy of holies. This dwelling place of God was so solemn and set apart that the veil would only be opened once a year. It was then that the high priest would meet with God. Pushing back the veil reveals the article above which this most holy meeting would occur. The Ark of the Covenant. Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it, and fasten them to its four feet, with two rings on one side, and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest, to carry it. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end, and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover of them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark a testimony, which I will give you. There, above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet and give you all my commands for the Israelites. Stored inside the ark were three very important reminders of the people's relationship with God. Each one reminded the Israelites of having learned a specific lesson from God. The value in keeping these three items was to build a remembrance of God's provision and direction for his children. Since the desert could not produce enough food for all the people, God provided a special food for them every morning, man. Six days of every week, they collected this heaven-sent food the Israelites had received this manna faithfully each morning for 40 years as an enduring testimony. A golden pot filled with manna was kept inside the ark. Inside the golden pot was an Omar's worth of manna, or one day's portion. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omar of man and keep it for the generations to come, so that they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. Then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the man in front of the testimony that it might be kept. The difficulties of life in the desert became a heavy toll for many of the Israelites. They even revolted against the leaders God had chosen for them. Yet, God proved to them that he had chosen their leader. The sign for this was Aaron's rod that had miraculously budded, flowered, and bore almonds all in one night. This was their reminder to not complain against the Lord's chosen. Speak to the Israelites and get twelve staffs from them one from the leader of each of their ancestral tribes. Write the name of each man on his staff. On the staff of Levi, write Aaron's name, for there must be one staff for the head of each ancestral tribe. 
place them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. The staff belonging to the man I choose will sprout, and I will rid myself of this constant grumbling against you by the Israelites. The next day, Moses entered the tent of the testimony and saw that Aaron's staff, which represented the house of Levi, had not only sprouted, but had budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. The Lord said to Moses, Put back Aaron's staff in front of the testimony to be kept as a sign to the rebellious. This will put an end to their grumbling against me, so that they will not die. The best known of the reminders kept inside the ark were the two stone tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. These tablets contained the primary rules they were to live by, which would protect and govern them. God would also use these to examine their faithfulness and commitment to following him. Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones, and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hand. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or his donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. It is here, just above the cover to the Ark of the Covenant, also known as the Mercy Seat, here in this space where the cherubim have set their full attention that God's presence would appear to and meet with the high priest on a specified day, and then only once a year. The Holy of Holies had no lampstand, no artificial light was permitted. Here in this place, where the immortal God would meet with the mortal man, the only light came from the powerful purity found in the presence of God. Thank you.
God told Moses that this earthly tabernacle was a model of the true one in heaven. He was to construct the tabernacle according to the pattern God showed him. The physical pattern was a model of spiritual patterns that were to be followed as well. We see the fulfillment of all these patterns or lessons in the person of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. Through his sacrifice on the cross, he made it possible for us to come into a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. When we come to fully understand and trust in Jesus as Messiah, we can then stand before God cleansed and forgiven. Is there yes. Yes. I hear you. I hear you. Are we going to go to the other side and we're going to show you something else? Oh, okay. I want to show you. Uh, I want to uh, show you something that we're going to be using here, another model that we're going to have, that we have right here at the board. And we're going to do uh, imaginary tour of the tabernacle. And we're going to check every pole, every curtain, everything that's in the tabernacle, and the symbolism of, uh, of it, the types that we're going to find, and the archetypes that we're going to find and the study of the tabernacle. If you study this and we go piece by piece, I assure you that you're gonna see God. All right, so now you're going to translate for okay. Elizabeth. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll do it, I'll do it bilingual up there. One moment, please. Okay, here we go. All right. Tell me when I'm on. Yeah. And they could hear. They could see it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Hello. I, I hope you could hear me. Uh, can everybody see the tabernacle here projected? It's dark. It's dark. Yeah. We imagine that much. But, uh, what I would ask you, what I suggest is that uh, if you're really interested in this, come in person, because <laughs> that way we could show you uh, things much better, and you could see it with your own eyes, rather with all these technical things. Okay? Eh, tenemos aquí en esta parte uh, un cuadro que tiene todo el tabernáculo, y vamos a ir por cada uno de ellos uh, hacia para dar un, un tour, para dar una gira alrededor de todo el tabernáculo y entrar a todos los lugares hasta que lleguemos a la cruz. Eh, una de las cosas que pueden ver, one of the things that you could see uh, here, uh, I know that it's dark and all that, but the tabernacle had it was covered by a curtain, and that curtain was a fence. It was sort of a fence, and it was 150 feet long, 30 feet to the size. Uh, this fence was seven and a half feet, typifying, and the symbol of it is that the Israelites who were outside, they couldn't come into the tabernacle because they they had sin in their life. They were sinful. They were not, their sins were not redeemed. So notice that around the whole tabernacle, uh, 
there was columns and there was a white uh, curtain made out of fine linen, white. But the only entrance to go into the outer court of the tabernacle was in the front. It only had one entrance in order for the Israelite to go into the atrium or what they call in simple English, the outer court. Uh, the tabernacle had three parts, the outer court and every Israelite could go in there. Eh, el tabernáculo solamente tenía una puerta uh, y estaba cercado a través de esa, con esa cortina que medía siete pies y medio de alto y a, a solamente tenía una entrada de 30 pies de ancho y se, a, la única forma de entrar al tabernáculo era a través de esa puerta. Por eso fue que Cristo dijo en Juan 19, yo soy la puerta. Entiendes que solamente había una forma de entrar. And then there was only one way to enter the tabernacle. But immediately when you enter the tabernacle, there was the altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice in order for you to meet with God, you had to do it uh, through another person, through the priest. But then you had to come in here and you realize, oh, I have to offer a sacrifice because I'm a sinful person. So they, they had to offer a burnt offering in the altar of Holocaust or the altar of sacrifice. Let me tell you that in that altar, sacrifices were made every day. That place smelled like blood. It smelled terrible. And what they do, they brought the animal, they will cut the head off, and they will put it on top of the altar and burn it. And some of the meat was used to sustain the Levites, which were the priests in the tabernacle. Uh, immediately after that, there was the labyrinth. And we're going to leave it there. And I'm going to tell you what they did in the labyrinth next time when we come back uh, next Thursday and how it typifies the cleansing. When you accepted Christ as your savior, you were cleansed of your sin. You were because of redemption of Christ. Uh, lo primero que pasaba cuando uno entraba al tabernáculo era que lo primero que te encontrabas era el altar del holocausto o el altar de sacrificio. Eh, estaba hecho de madera de chitín cubierta de bronce. Y ahí se quemaba sacrificio y se degollaba el animal, el cordero, y se ponía sobre el fuego. Porque eso decir, quería decir que tú no podías llegarte a, a Dios a menos que hicieses un sacrificio o una ofrenda de paz con él. El sacrificio que nosotros hemos dado es que nosotros entregamos nuestro cuerpo, los entregamos a Dios. Ese es el sacrificio que ofrecemos ahora, porque Cristo ya hizo el sacrificio, no hay necesidad de nada de esto. Eh, la semana que viene vamos a hablar del lavacro, el sitio donde se eh, el, el, el sacerdote cogía la sangre y Tenía que lavarse la cara, las manos y los pies antes de entrar al lugar santo a oficial por ti y por mí. Pero nadie podía entrar ahí sino el sacerdote. El otro lado era el lugar santísimo y solamente podía entrar ahí una vez al año llevando la sangre del sacrificio para hacer la expiación de pecado para todo el pueblo. Next week, we're going to study about the laver. We're going to study about the sacrifices that were done in the holy place. And the Day of Atonement, which was the day that the high priest, only the high priest, once a year was able to go. And I'm going to tell you more about how the sacrifice was made, how the, the high priest had to prepare themselves uh, to officiate in the holy place and if he did it if he did it wrong he would his his uh 
His leg was tied with a rope all the way outside to the outer court. And if he has sinned before God, he will die. And nobody could enter there, so they would drag him out. That's why they put the rope on his leg. So he's going to go in there uh, bearing the blood of the sacrifice that was burnt, uh, that was burnt in the altar of sacrifice outside. This altar was made of sheeting wood or acacia wood covered with bronze. And we're going to go more into it next week. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties, but we're going to do it better next time. So hang on with there because we haven't finished the tour. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll take them now. Sit here. Any questions out there? Okay, you're unmuted. Uh, is, is there any questions for me? Um, Archie, yeah. no se sabe, don, se sabe dónde quedaron esas cosas en la actualidad, el arca, ¿no? Uh, yes, déjame traducir lo que me preguntaste y te contesto. <laughs> Let me translate what the question that Elizabeth had, which is a very, very good question. <laughs> what happened to all these pieces? Where are they now? Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Where is the vessels of the tabernacle? Where are these curtains? Where are these poles? Where is the altar of sacrifice? Well, uh, I'm going to answer her in Spanish, and then I'm going to translate what I told her. Okay, so I'm doing a, a dual thing here. Bear with me and thank you for <laughs> your respect. Uh, Elizabeth? Elizabeth, ¿me oyes? Uh -huh. Sí, te voy a contestar tu pregunta. Uh, mucho después de esto, después que conquistaron a Jericó, y entraron a la ciudad de Hai y los israelitas eh, se establecieron en Canaán tuvieron pidieron un rey que se llamaba Saúl después de Saúl vino a uh, uh, David y después su hijo Salomón uh, Salomón quiso construir un templo a Dios uh, eh, durante la guerra de Masada uh, Nabucodonosor atacó a Jerusalén y se cree que todas estas cosas fueron destruidas o saqueadas o robadas porque eran bien valiosas. A pesar de que todavía hay arquitectos tratando de buscar debajo de donde estaba el templo, hay un sótano que nadie puede entrar. El gobierno israelita no lo permite, pero se hizo un nuevo templo y fue hecho por Salomón, pero el arca ya no existía. El arca desaparece en la Biblia y no dice, no dice qué pasó con él. Pero hay gente que todavía están buscando como Indiana Jones y toda esa gente. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, tell you what Elizabeth asked me and the answer that I gave him. And of course, of course, it, it was a very good uh, question. Uh, what happened to all this tabernacle? What happened to the Ark of the Covenant? What happened to the whole thing? Well, there was a war. Uh, I believe it was in the year 76. Uh, the Nebuchadnezzar uh, attacked uh, Israel, uh, Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they got into the temple. And uh, the temple... Uh, this new temple was built by Solomon, son of David. Uh, it was the last king before the Israelites were divided into two different tribes. But during, during Solomon's reign, uh, he built a, a, a temple, a new temple, and that's another study. Okay? But I'm going to tell you that they, they are believed, scientists and uh, theologists believe that uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the columns that were all made of gold, uh, the candlestick, or the, uh, the what they call the manabra now, 
uh, that was uh, uh, they robbed it and they melted the gold and they sold it. However, there's still people uh, investigating and archaeologists making investigation because it is believed to this day that the ark is somewhere. Uh, Indiana Jones could have find it. Okay, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember the movie? But uh, there's still archaeologists uh, searching in the temple uh, where the place that used to be the temple. Uh, there's a place called the Wailing War. And that was part of the temple. It was uh, just a uh, uh, stone thing there. And they still pray there. But under that, there is uh, a big, big, big uh, place where they have a lot of corridors and things and under the temple. The problem is that they cannot excavate because the Muslims have that place. It belongs to them. And there is a problem getting there. Uh, but they say, and I have seen a lot of archaeological uh, shows and programs that shows that those things were the, the, a lot of those vessels and the Ark of the Covenant is there. I disagree. I believe he was melted. I believe he was robbed. And I believe that gold was meant, 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 minted into coins. And uh, the Ark disappears. But there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of archaeologists still searching. That's what I could tell you about those things. Uh, let us uh, finish. By the way, did I answer the question? If there's no more question, we're going to close and pray. Any more questions? Any more questions? Hay otra preguntas? Hay alguna otra pregunta, Elizabeth? No, no. Oh, she said she has no more questions. <laughs> how, about, how about you, Monica? Monica? Okay, I hope you were able to hear and, and see the video better than we did uh, uh, on Tuesday. So, all right, good. good. We have uh, other things uh, that eventually are going to be showing you. Let me have the, the, the booklet that I brought. It's over there. That, that has, I'm going to show you some other things that uh, is going to clarify all this. Uh, this study is going to have a lot of illustrations. And uh, so you can have a visual uh, idea of how this tabernacle functions. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able, how good you'll be able to see it, but uh, you see this? Mm -hmm. there you see the tabernacle. Lo pueden ver. Muy bien. Yes. Uh, and then you see the Ark of the Covenant. You see the, the altar of incense. You see the candlestick or the land stamp, right? And you see the ta table of the shoe bread. And you see a very important guy there. This guy is called the high priest. And we're going to study all those garments piece by piece, typify Christ. Okay? And in his chest, he has he has something that, uh, in his garment. It's called the apot. Uh, and he has in the chest the 12 tribes of Israel with precious stones. Each stone typify one tribe. Okay? And then the top of the head, he has something called the mitra. And today, the Catholic Church, the Pope wears it. Or something similar to it. Because they copy a lot of things still from here. Okay? So we're going to talk about that priest and how he was dressed. And he has something down below at the hem of his garments that have bells. When he put the sacrifice and he took the blood, he takes the blood into the altar of the mercy seat of God. The Israelites were not there. It was only him. But they could hear the bells outside. And they would praise the God of Israel because he had made atonement for their sins. When they hear the bells, okay? When the Shekinah glory uh, will consume the blood of the sacrifice. We're going to talk very very in detail about this next week. 
Now uh, we're just going to leave with a word of prayer, Pastor. I pray you guys were blessed. And uh, I hope that uh, you were able to uh, take in some of the, the, the things about the tabernacle and the different pieces. And as we get into it more, we'll hear about the ceremony and the theology behind everything and why they did what they did. All right, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Jesus. We thank you, God, for, Father, for you showing us, Lord, that you have cared for humanity from the beginning of time. Lord, that from Genesis all the way through Revelation, Lord, you always were with your people, Lord God, as you are with us. Father, I pray that you would just reveal yourself to each and every one of us. Señor, te damos gracias, Señor, por su Thank palabra. You, Sabemos que tú has estado con nosotros de, de Génesis hasta Revelación. Señor, tú verdaderamente amas su, su gente como amas a nosotros. Señor, pedimos que tú estés con nosotros eh, eh, el gesto de esta semana. Lord, we pray. And we ask that you be with us the rest of this week. For we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ, our sanctifier. Jesus Christ, our healer. And Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for your attention. Uh, this was merely an introduction. There's so much here. And you're going to be blessed. He did a good job, right? So yes, I, want you, <laughs> I want you to open your spiritual eyes. Yes. If you wear glasses, put them on. But put on your spiritual eyes because you're going to see God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All right. Amen. God bless you. All right. Bye-bye. Very good, Archie. We enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. Okay. <laughs> okay. God bless you, Monica. Elizabeth. Miriam. Bye. 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 By the way, I want to tell you guys that uh, this study of the tabernacle is called typology. And uh, it is studied in seminaries and it's studied in big Bible colleges. And this is about a three year course. All right. <laughs> We're going to do it in three classes. Okay. God bless you. <laughs> okay. You can take a few more. Uh, bye someday bye. I'm going to give you a lot of material, too. Bye-bye. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>